Cereal grains. All right. So in, in cereal grain plants, okay, we have all of these cool growth stages. Okay, so if we're going to grow grain, we might ought to understand how this thing works. Now we have a grain chart out here that has uh, some really cool, in, in your thing you've got, uh, it's got lots of colors on it. It's got these little, there you go, exactly. Okay, okay if, if we go to the grain chart, that's it these bar charts, it tells us, it, now this is in general, okay, because we've got cereal grains, we've got wheat, barley, oats, we've got rye, there's a lot of different triticale, we've got a lot of different mixes that we can, we can start with, but all these plants are programmed. And so, if we're going to grow these plants, they all function according to this divine law. So if we understand what this law is and when the nutrition has to come into the plant, then we have a little bit better understanding of what our role as steward is. Because I can promise you that the plant does not alter its diet based on whether or not we get the nutrition there on time. So if the nutrition's not there, what do you think happens? Do you think the plant stops and says, I'll just hang out here until dinner's served? It keeps going. It keeps going, exactly, Mike. It says, guys, this train doesn't stop. I just keep on going. And what it does is it then says, I am going to do less. I don't have a resource. And so what we have to do is look at simply, how do I put the resources to the plant so that it can do what it's divinely instructed to do. Okay? And so the resources here are going to come from two things. Minerals that we get out of our soil or out of the air and then also our biology. Because the biology has to alter this stuff. So the food that we eat is not what we live off of. Okay? When we put fertilizer out in the soil, that, with rare exception, it is not in the form that a plant can use it. So who gets to change it? It's got to go solid. It has to go soluble. And so, who gets to do all this cool work? Plant can't take it up without it being soluble. It's not possible. Okay? These guys are not rock crushers. Okay? They have to have it in solution. Okay? So, who does the job of solubility? Biology. Microorganisms. That's exactly right, Abe. These little guys are already programmed. So when we have bacillus, we have pseudomonas, they come down there, they already know how to go make phosphate from tricalcium phosphate in your soil. We'll have soils that will have three, four, five, six, eight thousand pounds of phosphate in them. If you take a soil, go through an atomic absorption on it, you can look at the total number of all the elements in it. Now they're not soluble, because God doesn't do this. If everything was soluble in our soil, the first time it rained, it would melt like cotton candy. We'd lose every bit of it. Okay? So God doesn't do that. So in all of our soil that's out there, how much is actually in solution? 1%? Maybe? Half of 1%? A very, very small part. Okay? And so this is how God preserves or nature preserves minerals. Is it's never all soluble. Okay? Our job is to find out what we've got and then how to make it soluble. So it's not wasted. Because if it becomes soluble, then it goes away. As soon as we put water through it, whether it's rain, snow, flood, it will migrate where the water goes. 
and it usually doesn't always stay in the root system. So if we figure out how to manage this. Now, a lot of times we'll buy liquid fertilizers which are more soluble, okay? Plants get to them way easier, okay? We still have to have those minerals altered by biology for the plant to use, okay? Everything has to be restructured because we don't use it in the form that we take it in. We don't live off of hamburgers. As much as we like steak and potatoes, and rolls, that's not what our cells live off of. That stuff goes into our systems, it gets broken down with acid. We're, we're cool little acid machines. We produce hydrochloric acid, has a pH of about 2 right in our stomach, and we tear everything apart, especially our proteins. Okay, we then go into our digestion tract, into our intestinal tract, and it goes alkaline and we start to reabsorb it. And that's where our biology, the dominant groups of our biology live. And they take all this cool stuff and they go, you know what? <sighs> Abe needs more energy today. So we're gonna formulate some get up and go for Abe, okay? We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. We're gonna put in, we're gonna fix the heart, we're gonna fix the liver, we're gonna put in nutrition for the brain, we're gonna use all this wonderful cholesterol that you're not supposed to have, we're gonna make all your hormones out of it and all your brain food out of it, and we're gonna keep this guy going. That's what these guys do. That's their job is to fix and run and maintain all these systems, okay? Same thing in the soil. We put out minerals, we have to have the assistance of the biology to turn it into a plant food. And that's how this stuff works. If we feed something to the animal without biology, it is all going to go out the back door. Because it's got to get broken down and restructured. Okay? So, for example, let's talk about when you start trying to put things through a plant membrane. Or through an intestinal membrane. Okay? Abe, you think there's holes in our intestine big enough for a hamburger to go through? Shouldn't be. All right. So we have to have about six to seven hundred atoms or smaller to go through these holes. That's pretty small. Okay. So let's just look at this for a minute. If I've got calcium that's 40, I've got molybdenum that's 99, I've got zinc that's roughly in the 60s, my manganese is over here in the high 50s, I can't put too many of these things together before they're just too big to get absorbed. I have to keep them apart and keep them broken down. Well, all of this is somehow in the structure of our hay, our grain, and so it's the biology that takes this apart and puts it into these very, very tiny compounds. And if we don't have this happening, it doesn't get taken up by the plant, it stays in the soil, it doesn't get taken up by the animal, and it gets passed out the back door as manure. So all these resources that we put in don't get used if we don't have these microbes to do that. So there's, there's a couple of ways to deal with these microbes. We can either stimulate them or we can put them there ourselves. Okay? And so this is what we're going to start talking about. But these plants, let's go back to our wheat plants. When we look at this diet, we have a specific time when the plant says, I need nitrogen, I need phosphate, I need potassium. Because all of these minerals have a direct physiological effect on the plant and what it can do. If we want to grow bigger root systems, okay, get that going early and get it, get it happening, can't happen without phosphate. <coughs> can't keep my plant standing up without potassium and copper and manganese. I can't get photosynthesis going on without magnesium and this little guy right here. Manganese, which is a trace mineral that splits the water. Okay, every mineral up here has a whole host of physiological functions. 
Okay, so ever hear of a drought in Montana? It's a good thing. You guys don't need any zinc then. Because zinc runs just under 400 enzymes, and we're going to learn about what those are. But zinc is one of your major minerals for drought resistance and water efficiency. So, if I'm going to have a drought, what would I be better equipped with? The minerals that help the plant function with less water. And those are almost all predominantly trace elements. And we don't have two or three trace elements. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of them. We don't buy them because no one wants to sell them. We get a few of them and they help, but there's more out there, okay? So as we talk about minerals, there's minerals that go to our bones, minerals that go to our brain, minerals that go to our soft tissue, minerals that go to our heart. How does it know where to go? Well, thank heavens God programmed that. We don't have to go to the doctor to figure that out. Okay, those things just come as part of the intelligence in us. But to make these things work, we have to have minerals. And the other thing that we're going to talk about is every mineral, like for example, phosphate, okay? The brilliant part of this is when God put this together, we've got phosphate over here, okay? Phosphate, when we start up over here, we're going to buy it in a non-soluble form. Okay? Even if we're buying 1034, 1137, or phos acid, that is still not the form the plant uses it in. P2O5 is not used by plants. We've got to have hydrogen go with it. Okay? So we've got some really smart microbes down there that say, I know what to do with this. I'll just fix it in the right form. Okay? These guys up there don't know what they're doing but I'll fix it for them, okay? So we got some really good mechanics. This is ultimately gonna become the basis of your fats and your oils, and it's also your plant's energy molecule, okay? So if my phosphate can't change forms, I can't use it. Phosphate, in any form that I buy it, is never the right form. Once it gets fixed, it's going to go into millions of different forms. Okay, and we're going to talk about plants and how they change this stuff. Okay, and we're going to look at any guesses on how many compounds plants make. If anybody comes close, our associate Dave in the back will give you a hundred dollar bill. I will gladly volunteer Dave for this process. <laughs> Abe, any guesses? George? One percent. Oh, I got a number. Not a percent, I need a number. Mike? Think big guys. Well, it's worth a hundred bucks. I see a trillion. I mean, not there. Oh, we're a little over there. Okay, <laughs> not quite that big. Okay, when we start looking into plant compounds, we're into somewhere in the thirty to fifty million range, and we think plants are stupid. No, no, no. These guys are absolutely brilliant if you give them the resources to work with. Because that's the divine intelligence that God put there. They all know what to do. The only handicap is, is we don't give them anything to do it with. Okay? So, as we go into this, every mineral needs a helper. So, for me to get phosphate into all of these thousands of different forms, it's going to have to have potassium. It's going to have to have zinc. It's going to have to have boron. It's going to have to have manganese. It's going to have to have cobalt. 
and copper. And it's going to have to have help in all of these changes. That's why when we just farm NPK, we can build part of plant structure, but we don't build plant nutrition. Okay, and we're going to talk about this. Okay, so the cool thing is, as we go through this, if we understand how these systems work and what it takes to make them work, all we're doing is helping these plants do what they're designed to do. Because we are not going to teach them anything. In fact, we are here to be their students, if we'll pay attention. And so, so as we go through this, every mineral has to have dozens and dozens of other minerals to get it to be usable. And so, nitrates. Marty, how do nitrates help your cows? They don't. Okay, that's a trick question. Nitrates, when you give, you, you give nitrates to cattle, what happens to them? Kills. Kills them. Okay, so, but I put nitrates out in my field. Is that the right form? Now, if I can turn it into an amino acid, or a peptide, or a protein, then what happens, Marty? Flourish. Ah, oh, I can sell an animal that's still alive. And someone can benefit from that. So every element that we start with has got to get converted into thousands and thousands of different compounds through thousands of different processes. And it takes minerals and biology to do that.